Um, now, Sam, uh, we have been working together also for quite some time. Um, you are heading a very interesting investment firm that is investing across Africa in retail, in agriculture, in logistics. You have personally a big experience with logistics. With this, I remember our virtual chats during pandemic, ensuring logistics in Africa during COVID-19. When we look back at the six re uh, no regret moves I presented at the beginning, supply chain resilience was one of the important ones. So very much looking forward to your sp statement. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here, everybody. A lot has been, has been said on the topics. And I think what I would like to focus on is the lessons that businesses have learned from all of the, the activities happening around the world from a geopolitical perspective. I think for far too long, businesses, especially businesses from our part of the world, have been spectators uh, when it comes to, to geopolitical activities and so on and so forth. And I think until the pandemic, when the impact of a global situation starts to hit every part of the world, did we start to realize that as businesses, we have a responsibility to make sure that we have a clear focus on geopolitics. So the question today is, from all of the headwinds that we have had over the past couple of years, from COVID to uh, supply chain uh, uh, chaos around the world, to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, to energy crisis, to inflation, and so on and so forth, what are the lessons that businesses have learned and what are the things that businesses should start to do in order to make sure that at least from a very strategic perspective that we're able to have a resilient uh, supply chain and supply chain infrastructure. And this is very important because we, c we have seen now firsthand the kind of havoc that political activities or geopolitical activities in different parts of the world could have in economies you know, where we do business or where we're present. An example is Sri Lanka. I guess at the beginning of the war in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, and the hyperinflation uh, activities that started as a result around the world, people, for example, in Sri Lanka could not uh, you know, draw a line between the food crisis that they were going to have in their country or the, the, the energy crisis or the availability of imported uh, fuels in their country with what was happening in Ukraine or Russia. And the same thing in Africa, especially from a food perspective. It was in the beginning of the, of the war, uh, something that was happening in another part of the world until the price of baguette started to rise uh, in many parts of Africa and the price of basic food items and fertilizers, for example, started to happen. Did businesses or political leadership start to understand that we are indeed in a global village and that that global village could have very positive and also very negative uh, consequences and perspectives. So the question is then what lessons have businesses learned and how do we start to make sure that we build a resilient uh, supply chain infrastructure to protect our businesses from all of these kinds of headwinds that we have seen and not knowing the ones that will come into the, into the future. If I refer to the slides that, that we saw, obviously everybody wants a back to the future uh, scenario. But uh, the last time I looked at the crystal ball, Donald Trump won the election in the United States. And the second time I looked, Saudi Arabia beat Argentina at the World Cup. So we're not going to try to uh, look into a crystal ball. But the question then is that maybe we should prepare for the worst because we don't know what tomorrow is going, is going to bring. So how do we start to do that? From a personal perspective, from some of our businesses, for example, I think one of the first things that is important is to understand that geopolitics is a thing that affects businesses, so how do businesses react to it? Just like uh, many, many years ago, there started to be a title called the Chief Technology Officer, and I remember being in university when there was a debate uh, around this kind of subject. Today, it's a no-brainer. Perhaps it's very interesting that we start also now as businesses to start to make sure that we have a spearhead for trade and trade relations or geopolitical activities, and I know that a lot of work has been done around this uh, by Nikki and, and co at BCG. Uh, for example, the question about having a chief trade officer in businesses, so that we can be able to learn from the past and forecast a little bit what is going to happen in the future given uh, the geopolitical map uh, of the world, and make sure that we're able to be not only resilient, but responsive to the activities that can come about as a result of uh, geopolitical tensions. And it brings me to the next point, which is speed to reaction. Uh, I take an example of the pandemic. Uh, when the pandemic happened, a lot of people 
uh, including myself here, for example, sat back a little bit to say, okay, let's try to understand what's going to happen. The world is going to be shut down for maybe a few weeks uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, a few weeks became a few months and, and you know, things just got you know, worse and worse. And businesses started to realize that you have to get up you know, and do something. Speed to action then becomes the next thing such that businesses make sure that as situations evolve, you evolve uh, along with it and so on. Now, when we look at the impact of you know, the supply chain chaos, uh, say for example from China, and only thankfully recently the Chinese governments have lifted the restrictions on, uh, on China, you start to understand then the need for localization, the need to make sure that supply chain is brought closer and closer to home as much as possible. It sounds impossible in the beginning, but imagine uh, you know, uh, businesses that depended, for example, on materials coming from, uh, or manufacturing coming from China, for instance, or material coming from different parts of the world where one uh, political or geopolitical activity has hit or the other, Ukraine, Russia, and so on and so forth, how that impacts your supply chain and how that impacts your business. So localization then becomes something that we have to take more and more seriously, finding nearer and nearer markets where raw materials or even markets for, for finished products could end up such that we don't uh, find ourselves you know, uh, caught unawares uh, with things like this as they happen more and more. The next thing is the question as to how businesses are indeed structured. Um, I think that for a long time, businesses have very much relied on this very monolithic uh, structure where decisions are made from the center or from some particular geography, like a head office or as the case may be, perhaps to a more polycentric structure where we break down the activities of our businesses, especially uh, for people like uh, myself who are in multi-business uh, uh, industries or multi-sectors to start to understand the impact of geopolitics in different kinds of businesses and how to then make sure that you are uh, more and more uh, able to respond to challenges as they happen closer to the geographies you know, where they happen. Instead of relying on, uh, on some headquarters somewhere that might be six, seven, eight hours away uh, and uh, responsiveness does, does not happen as effectively as it should. Then, of course, there is the ever-present question of you know, technology, digital acceleration. That is extremely important. Again, especially from my part of the world, uh, in Nigeria today, the outburst of you know, fintechs has been you know, phenomenal. And people did not realize the impact that technology would have on their lives and the impact that technology would have in helping to solve very basic social issues. I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in a lot of countries in Africa during the pandemic, of course, schools were closed. And I think this was when, as parents, we realized the importance of teachers. You know, for someone like me, I have a seven and a four year old at home. <laughs> you can imagine, you know, trying to, to uh, you know, shepherd them around. And you find that technology, for example, in education has then started to help to make sure that children were kept engaged, were busy. And these were certain technologies that people didn't think about you know, prior to uh, the pandemic, for example, or in healthcare, or as the case may be. So the issue of digital acceleration could not, of course, be uh, uh, overemphasized in trying to respond to uh, you know, the, the geopolitical impacts of activities in, in, in the world, and especially building a resilient supply chain. Finally, I think is sustainability. Uh, again, this is a topic that you know, has become crucial, and we can see it with activities happening in several parts of the world, and ignoring it is, is in, our own, uh, in our own peril. I think it was the United Nations uh, Secretary General that talked about you know, a, 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 what did he, a, a climate suicide if, if mm. we did nothing you know, about, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the climate and making sure that we build in sustainability into our planning. So in effect, for me, the, the general summary is making sure that from everything that is happening around the world from a geopolitical perspective, that we're able to embed this in our decision making, more especially to make sure that we keep our supply chain infrastructure as resilient as possible to, to these challenges.
Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, having worked in logistics for the last uh, 20 to 30 years, I think uh, you have proven how to keep logistics and supply chain working also in the most challenging environment of Africa. So I think sure. uh, it's great, great to have your perspective here as well. So. Um,